where did your interest in, in innovation in particular begin? Um, I think from a, a couple different places. So uh, both of my parents were, were neuroscientists, so I, I certainly uh, learned a lot about science growing up. Um, I really, my first major exposure to public policy uh, was on the 1988 um, presidential campaign. Uh, and I, I worked for a part of the campaign called the Issues Department. And one of the things that you need to do is to, um, no, no matter what part of the country the candidate is visiting, ensure that they know about what's happening to the industries in that state. And in the uh, late 80s, uh, one of the things that was going on was that the United States was not doing well, uh, not only in traditional uh, manufacturing industries like steel and, and autos and machine tools, but also in emerging uh, high-tech industries. And I, I thought that was really a problem. Uh, and I was interested in what were the factors that were driving that and what, if any, role uh, public policy could create uh, the, a more conducive environment to U.S. economic competitiveness. Mm -hmm. So a term that you've used to describe the work that you did at OSTP was policy entrepreneurship. And I referred to you as a policy entrepreneur, which, which I think of as, as a uh, high compliment for someone who is working in a government setting. And you know, people tend to have a view of government as kind of drudging bureaucracy and, and craven politics. But um, tell us a little bit about, about what that means and maybe some examples of, of how that played out in your work at OSTP. Sure, yeah, so I think in, in part, uh, a, a policy entrepreneur is someone who is attentive to new ideas. Um, so the way in which I would do that is uh, I would just talk and visit with a lot of people and, and be both sort of receptive to the ideas uh, that they had, but also ask them the questions that I was asking myself. Um, so I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, so one element of uh, President Obama's innovation strategy was that in the same way that uh, President Kennedy said, let's put astronauts on the moon and have them safely return by the end of the decade, and we not only sequenced the human genome, but drove down the cost of that from $100 million for the first one to now rapidly approaching $1,000. What are the similarly ambitious goals that we should be setting in the 21st century? Um, and every once in a while, I would get a really good answer to that question. So one answer came from uh, a community of neuroscientists that were collaborating with people in the physical sciences and engineering. And they said, we think there's an opportunity to do for neuroscience what the Human Genome Project did for genetics, to develop the tools that allow us to understand uh, how the, the brain in action, how does the brain encode and process information. Um, and uh, I got really excited about that idea. and. Um, worked with the neuroscientists within the federal government, and they thought it was an idea that was worth pursuing. And so with the support of President Obama, we were able to get initial funding for it uh, in, um, in, in 2013, uh, and then over time, build the coalition of organizations that are contributing to this, uh, starting off with NIH and DARPA and the National Science Foundation, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Kavli Foundation, uh, and, the, and the Allen Institute. And now we have over $3 billion in financial commitments from both the government uh, and uh, private foundations. Um, and uh, there's a lot of excitement around this area and that it could ultimately, it will take a long time, but it could improve our ability to diagnose, treat, and prevent diseases of the brain, increase our fundamental understanding about how 80 billion neurons and 100 tr trillion synapses interact to create learning, memory, and consciousness uh, and lead to new uh, computer architectures that are informed by how the brain works. So that's what I mean by policy entrepreneurship, being exposed to an idea and then figuring out who would need to do what in order to move it forward and then actually going out and building that coalition of the willing and able. Yeah, fascinating. and, and I you know, to hear you describe that initiative, I mean, I, I think it is an example of sort of the, the power of very clear, specific communications and goal setting. Um, 
I'd be interested to hear some of some of the other projects and initiatives that you're you're most proud of, the goals achieved and, and initiatives that continue on. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> when I worked for uh, President Clinton, um, I uh, stumbled across a group of program managers that were operating at science agencies like NSF and NASA um, who were interested in nanoscale science and engineering. Um, and um, I, uh, <clears throat> fortunately, in, in 1993, um, I, I was the first person who had showed most people in the White House uh, what the internet was. So I gave them all a demonstration of Mosaic, and I said, you know, this is, this is gonna be a big deal. So, um, so that like gave me a certain amount of uh, uh, credibility. So when I started people telling people in the, in the 90s that there was this new field that allowed us to uh, manipulate matter at the uh, atomic and molecular level, and it was going to be the equivalent of adding another dimension to the periodic table of elements in terms of our ability to tune the properties of materials. What I did was to go out and talk to the research community and say, uh, if we increased our investment in this area, what are some things that might come out of this? Um, and they said things that were totally incomprehensible. So we, they said, well, we might have uh, functionalized MRI contrast agents and materials with a Young's modulus of this many gigapascals and uh, molecular electronics with a storage density of 10 to the 15 bits per cubic centimeter. Um, and after I under understood what they were talking about that, I was able to, to turn that into uh, we could store the Library of Congress in a device the size of a sugar cube, make materials that are stronger than steel and a fraction of the weight, and detect cancerous tumors before they're visible to the human eye. And armed with those examples, uh, uh, we were able to convince President Clinton to embrace this idea, and that's led to uh, $23 billion in federal funding, and it, that effort survived the transition uh, from uh, President Clinton to President Bush, to President Obama, to uh, the uh, the current administration. That's great. So now that you're not in the in the White House, what what are you working on now, and what are you doing specifically for for in the work with Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google? Um, so he in November uh, created a new organization called Schmidt Futures, um, which uh, is going to have the the flexibility to not only engage in grant making to universities and nonprofits, but also to invest in commercial firms and where necessary also to support advocacy related activities. The three broad themes that we're currently focused on is the role that uh, modern computing technologies, particularly data science, and machine learning and artificial intelligence are going to play in accelerating the pace of scientific discovery. Um, the second is asking a similar set of questions, but with respect to what role these technologies can play in addressing societal challenges. And the third is the challenge of shared prosperity. Some parts of the country are doing really well and others are not. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're also seeing, particularly for non-college educated workers, that they're experiencing declining real wages, declining levels of labor force participation, and the possibility that technological change could further reduce the, the demand for workers with relatively low skills. So how do we address this to America's challenge? How do we create uh, more opportunities for economic and, and social mobility? So those are the three broad themes in which we're uh, identifying specific opportunities for, for grant making and investment. Yeah. So in what you were just describing, the, the important role of education um, was, was Prominent there, and uh, you know we're we're here with a, a community of educators, people who have really created, I think, uh, incredible impact across the country, working with their colleagues, transforming their institutions, um, and the student-led innovation is really at the core of what we do. And you'll all have a chance to you know meet with some of the student innovators later this evening at the Open Minds event, um, and. You work with student innovators as well and work with mm -hmm. students at, at UC Berkeley. Um, how did you get interested in doing that and what are you, what are you currently working on? Yeah, so it was really uh, serendipitous. So like when I arrived, I thought my job is gonna be working with the chancellor and the provost and the vice chancellor and the deans and department chairs and faculty members. Um, and one day, uh, a, two students arrived 
uh, at my office. And so one of the things I was doing for the campus was to help coordinate the campus activities in nanoscale science and engineering. And they said, we want to form the Berkeley Nanotechnology Club. And in short order, what, one was an MBA student, one was a graduate student in mechanical engineering. And in short order, they had recruited 300 student members. They started organizing an annual forum with Nobel laureate and CEO level speakers. Um, they were helping to foster the commercialization of Berkeley research in micro and nanotechnologies. And whenever I had a question that required student input, um, they would set up a web-based survey uh, and within 72 hours, I would get a spreadsheet with an analysis of all the student responses. I'll leave to your imagination how that compared with what happened when I sent the faculty an email. <laughs> um, so I thought, well, this is really cool. And then I wound up getting a small uh, unrestricted grant uh, from uh, uh, Piero Midiar. And I decided to use that to see if I could replicate that very positive experience that I'd had in sort of tapping into student interest and energy and, and passion in, in other areas. Mm -hmm. um, and that led to the creation of a program called uh, Big Ideas at, at Berkeley. And um, uh, one of the leaders of the program, uh, Sophie Martin, is, is an attendee uh, in, in the conference. And um, it's, I've just been continuously amazed about what students can get done uh, by having a, uh, an artificial deadline, uh, permission, small amounts of funding and connections to uh, resources on and off campus and teaching students how to have influence without authority. So I gave, when I was first starting the program, uh, I gave one group of students the princely sum of $3,000. They used that to pass a student fee referendum with 69% of the vote that generated $1.7 million to green the campus. And then the principal undergraduate organizer uh, I was able to help her get a fellowship, and so she spent the next year after she graduated helping another 10 campuses replicate a similar model. So you could very rapidly create this virtuous circle between the results that the students were able to generate and the ability to mobilize additional resources to back that project on the basis of, of those results, as opposed to, you know, as the university often does, we're going to do all these awesome things, you know, once you give us some more money. Right. Uh, here you were able to point to what the students had actually accomplished uh, and their sort of enthusiasm is, is very infectious. That's, a, I think, a great example of that policy entrepreneurship and a dimension that, um, you know, certainly we embrace in our work and, and many of the people here are, are I think, exemplars of, of engaging students in entrepreneurship and applying the tools of entrepreneurship to make change happen, I think. Uh, in, in the policy space and thinking about the tools that students have within the institution is, is another great way to do that. Um, you recently wrote a paper making the case for enabling students to major in a discipline and minor in a problem. Um, why are you excited about that and, and what, what does that imply about what would be needed to change in the structure of the institution to make that happen? Yeah, so I, I want to make it clear that some of this is already going on. Uh, in, in universities, and universities are, are pursuing this idea in a number of different ways. So for example, um, one of the things that uh, when I was working for President Obama, I worked with the National Academy of Engineering, and there were a group of deans uh, that had created something called the Grand Challenge Scholars Program, which the, the late uh, Ch Chuck Vest, who was former president of MIT and president of the National Academy of Engineering, were really uh, passionate about. And the uh, idea was that an undergraduate engineering student would organize their uh, coursework, research, service learning, entrepreneurial activities, and, and international activities around one of the grand challenges that had been identified by the National Academy of, of, of Engineering. So it's that type of thing. It's, it's uh, allowing students not only to think about their particular discipline, but is there a particular problem whether it's accelerating the transition to a low carbon economy uh, or addressing the fact that uh, over a billion people don't have access to safe drinking water and, and uh, sanitation um, that they really want to dig into. So we're always talking about how we want more T-shaped people that have depth in one area and enough breadth to be able to participate in cross-functional teams. And what I'm interested in exploring is what if the top of that T was organized around a problem as, as opposed to yet another discipline. So 
It, what are the implications of that in terms of how the institution uh, uses its resources and, and the role of faculty? Yeah, so um, as I said, I think some of this is going on, but what I'm interested in is what would it take to make this more, to move from the periphery of the university to the center? Uh, so as, as opposed to you know, a relatively small percentage of highly entrepreneurial students that manage to do this uh, almost uh, in spite of, as opposed to uh, because of the institution, uh, what would it mean to say we would like you know, a, a large fraction, if not ultimately all, of our students to have this, this type of experience? And you know, obviously, one challenge is that the real world does not respect the org chart uh, of a university. Um, and so uh, you know, the, uh, there was a group of students that came together around safe drinking water and sanitation at, at UC Berkeley. And there were people in civil and environmental engineering who were working on the technology. Um, there were uh, people in the business school who were looking at uh, pricing and willingness to pay. There were people in public health looking at the epidemiological dimensions of access to safe drinking water. And when the students went overseas, when they went to uh, the slums of Mumbai uh, and encountered slum lords, their self-report when they came back was, you know, we thought that this was really about uh, the technology. How are we going to develop a $10 filter from locally available parts? And we came away from that experience with the recognition that technology is about 10 to 20 percent of the problem, and all these other things that were not, you know, in covered in our courses were, were far more important. And you know, in, in the work that e-teams do, there's often that, that kind of rich contextual uh, learning that takes place and is often driven by the problem that is the focus of the work of the team. And often that problem is, is what's kind of held up and elevated. Um, are, how would you measure learning in this kind of, of context? When you talk about you know, a, a T-shaped person what, what are the dimensions of, of measure that you would use for that, and, and how does that affect sort of the, the evaluation and maybe even the accreditation approach that's taken? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so, you know, Carol talked about uh, mindsets, and I, I think that's an important dimension uh, for this. My, one of my favorite definitions of, entre of an entrepreneur is someone who is not limited by the resources currently under their control. Um, so, so, you know, someone who is able to, you know, get other individuals and organizations to take some action it, when they're in a position where, um, you know, those are not people that are, are you know, reporting to them. So I, th I think the sort of mindset, the, the level of ambition uh, that the students have, the sort of uh, ex their ability to, to build coalitions, their ability to understand what constraints people are currently operating under and whether there's anything that they can do to relax those constraints. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not sure whether we have the, the tools right now to really be able to assess all, all these things. Yeah. And, I, you know, I've experienced um, at Earth University, I don't know if people are familiar that it's in Costa Rica, they have a entrepreneurship program. And in order to graduate, if you're an entrepreneur in that program, you actually have to start run a business, make some money, and then um, fold the business up in order to graduate. And if you don't succeed in doing those things, you can't graduate. Um, and I asked them, well, so what happens if the business doesn't succeed? And, you know, they have some flexibility around the roles, but I think that, you know, that kind of, of uh, demonstration of, of all of the kinds of capabilities that you described might actually wind up being what you, what you have people do, not necessarily in the form of a business, but in some way. I want, I want to shift focus a little bit to, to come back to uh, something you talked about a little bit earlier is, is uh, work that you're focused on now in terms of um, regional economic disparities and trying mm -hmm. to, to level that. Uh, you know, one of the areas of, of um, disparity is clearly around the availability of risk capital. Yep. Um, you know, it's very much a, a at the coasts distribution uh, in very small geographic areas um, and not accessible to most people and not accessible in most areas. So I'm, I'm interested to hear what, you know, what role, uh, in particular for this audience, can universities and, and people who are change makers in their universities uh, do to, to address that? 
Yeah, so I, I think that there are a number of instances uh, where universities have played a, a really important role in terms of strengthening the, the regional innovation ecosystem. Obviously, it starts with uh, the human capital, uh, the you know undergrads and, and graduate students that uh, that their institutions are are producing, um, uh, allowing uh, more students to get exposure uh, to uh, entrepreneurial experiences. So the universities in in uh, Colorado mm -hmm. um, have a startup summer program, so that um, that undergraduate students can have some real experience. Uh, in what it's like to work at a startup, because obviously startups don't recruit. They're not gonna show up like the consulting firms and the accounting firms and, and the banks. Um, so I think that's a really interesting model. Um, some institutions are trying to figure out how they can become more open. Uh, so Case Western Reserve University has something called the Think Box, which has coffee on the ground floor, design, prototyping, and fabrication spaces on the middle floors and an accelerator on the top floor, and that's something that they're opening up, not just to the faculty, students, and staff, but members of the, excuse me, members of the community. Mm -hmm. um, so th those are a couple things that I think universities can do. And, and which, do, do those things fit with the pillars of the, the university, sort of as, as we commonly think of, you know, research, education, um, and outreach, service. or is, <laughs> service? Yes, yeah. so, you know, uh, I. I think there's a legitimate question about, even though uh, you know universities talk about research, education, and service, um, there's a, 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 a classic management science article called "The Folly of Rewarding A and Expecting B." Mm -hmm. um, and so, if if a university says research, education, and service, but it, when it comes time to evaluating, uh, you know, promotion and tenure, uh, if one of those factors is uh, emphasize to the exclusion of the other two, then you shouldn't be surprised that that uh, you know it's more difficult to get faculty to to pay attention to the other two. Yeah. So, if you had to point to some things you see sort of over the horizon happening in the innovation space, and in particular as they connect with universities, what what are some things that you're most excited about? Yeah. So you know you talked about the concentration of venture capital. Um, in a handful of regions in, in, in the Bay Area, in the Cambridge, Boston area, and, and New York City. Um, I think that we also have a challenge in that there are a lot of areas where we need innovation, um, where the venture model is not working terribly well because the innovation in question takes a long time uh, and is capital intensive. So, you know, if a, if a venture capitalist sees something like WhatsApp and a small team can create $17 billion in market value in a very short period of time, you should not be stunned that when the, you know, there's a Monday uh, partners meeting and, and some, someone has an idea for a, a software startup that they think could be hugely profitable and other, some, someone says, well, I've got an idea for how we might use, you know, quantum dots for solar cells and we'll find out, you know, in five, in five years whether or not this is gonna work and it's gonna cost probably $100 million, uh, that you know, more and more VC has been going into these areas that are uh, highly capital efficient and where you can find out relatively quickly whether or not you produced software or an app or, or, or some IT-enabled solution that has value in the marketplace. Um, so I think that that's a really important area and, and we're beginning to see a lot of interesting models for how to address that. Uh, so one uh, in my neck of the woods uh, is uh, Cyclotron Road, which is affiliated with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And it is a spin-on model rather than a spin-off model. So rather than the emphasis being Lawrence Berkeley has these great technologies and we're gonna try to figure out how to commercialize them, Cyclotron Road does a call for entrepreneurs uh, who are science-based entrepreneurs and then uh, with funding from a variety of different sources, they are uh, creating these fellowships that, that give the scientists and engineers uh, access to the resources of Lawrence Berkeley, uh, you know, the incredible uh, uh, shared user facilities, and a uh, one to two year runway uh, to develop or prototype and, and maybe get some additional uh, grant funding from the government. And then 
be in a position to, to attract additional capital um, once they've increased the technological maturity of their ideas. So models like that are going to be really important because um, we need innovation in lots of different areas, not just in information technology. And the same way that we should be concerned about the geographic concentration of, of early stage risk capital, we should also be concerned about the concentration by sector as well. I, I want to come um, back to another important form of capital, which is human capital, and thinking yep. about uh, the, the diversity of, of the science and technology uh, doers mm -hmm. who are involved in executing on, on these great ideas and, and bringing the idea from discovery into some form of application. Uh, what are things that you think are, are working in terms of uh, fostering diversity in science and technology? Well, um, I think, you know, one uh, high leverage point, which is just beginning to get um, the attention that I think it deserves, is how are scientists and engineers and entrepreneurs uh, portrayed it in the media, in TV, in, in film, and things like that. And so, uh, if you're a student of color, or uh, if you're a young woman, and the only, um, you know, the only scientists and engineers you see are, are white males, then that's obviously sending the message that you have to be a white male in, in order to be interested in, in, in STEM. Um, so, I, so that is beginning to change, um, and so I, I think that's one potential leverage point. One thing that President Obama did was just to try to lift up STEM in general. So um, he decided that, you know, since it's the case that if you win the Super Bowl or the NCAA, you get to come to the White House, the same thing should be true if you win a science fair or, or robotics competition. The only downside of this is that it made the White House staff feel like slackers because we would uh, meet these 16-year-old girls who were already figuring out how to use functionalized gold nanoparticles to develop smart anti-cancer therapeutics to destroy tumors while leaving healthy cells untouched. And I don't know about you, but at 16, I was playing Dungeons and Dragons as opposed to working on a cure for cancer. But, but it was really inspiring uh, to see uh, uh, these uh, young uh, innovators and inventors and, and scientists uh, beginning at, at, a, at a really early age. And I think what you have to do is to figure out how to pr uh, provide those opportunities for, for more of our young people. Well, we are about out of time, so I want to thank you. I'm glad we were able to convince you to come here, and I appreciate your empathy with the audience. Please join me in thanking Tom Khalil for thank making you. this a priority. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.